Hi, welcome to St. Andrews. I hope you all have had a great week. We're so happy to have you guys with us for worship this morning. Please stand as we begin our worship.
are so grateful that your presence is in this place and that at your presence, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord and evil cannot be here. So God, we give you thanks and praise that you have overcome. You've overcome death and hell and all evil in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would help our ears to be open today. Let our praise be pleasing to you and let us offer it with open hearts, open minds to what you have for us today. It's in Christ's name that we pray and everybody said, Amen. Thank you, friends. You may be seated. Welcome to worship here at St. Andrew's Community United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have joined us for worship today where our mission is making disciples of Jesus Christ. And friends who are joining us online, we welcome you as well. We've got a lot of great things going on in the life of our church. If you picked up a bulletin today, you will have seen our insert for our midweek classes. We've got a great lineup of classes starting on February 5th. Everything from how to make drones to how to paint a picture to how to face giants in your life. So I hope that you will either use this piece of paper to sign up, you can put your name and information there, and you can put it in the offering plate when it passes by here in just a few moments, or you can go online or use the St. Andrews app to sign up as well. We also have something really fun happening this week. On Thursday night, we're having a St. Andrews Hooray event. That's for everybody in the church, and we're going to be at Skate more having a skate night from six to nine it's free to you so come bring your kids bring your grandkids it's going to be a lot of fun these events really are designed so that you can invite people in your community neighbors co-workers friends that may not have a church home and so we hope that you'll do that and then they'll come and see how much fun we are as a family of faith and how bad we are at skating so it'll be great, lots of fun. Then also I wanted to remind you that confirmation signups are open. You can sign up in the connector today if you want a hard copy sign up, or you can also sign up online or the St. Andrews app. This is for our sixth graders, maybe a fifth grader, maybe a seventh grader if they haven't been through that yet. But if you have a child or a grandchild that is ready to go through confirmation, I hope that you will sign them up. This is a great time for them to learn about the history of the church, but even more importantly, it offers them the opportunity to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. It's one of the most important things that we do all year, so I hope you'll mark your calendar for that as well. Friends, it's a great day to be together as a family of faith. Would you stand and greet each other? friends as you make your way back to your seats I've got some new friends up here with me today you want to wave everybody say hi hello everybody that's exciting okay so I brought you in today friends because I really need your help do you think you could help me with something I need to figure out what on earth this is I can't figure it out I'm not really sure why we were given these this morning but I was looking at it at the last service and I was thinking that maybe I could use it as a hat you don't think so? I think it gives me some nice accessories to my outfit. You don't think so? Well, a bag? No, no, no. I don't think it's a bag. I think what it really... Oh, I know what it could be. No, I think it could be a shoe. Yes, but I've only got one of them, so it can't be that. So maybe instead of using it for my head or my feet, maybe I should use it for something else. Do you have any ideas? It's for food. What yeah. kind of food, Margo, do you think we're supposed to put in this bag? 
Oh, food that can go to the people that are poor. Good job, because, high five, because we have a lot of people in our community, don't we, who need food. So here's what we're going to do today. The adults were given some of these bags when they came in, were you? Do you have one with you? Can you hold it up so the kids can see it? Yes, there you go. There they are, there they are, exactly. So here's what I need for you guys to do. They're all going to pick up bags when they leave today if they didn't get one, and I need for each one of you to pick up bags as well because we're going to have a little competition. Yeah, we know. Yeah, <laughs> we are going to have just a little competition between the adults and the kids. So I'm wondering, who do you think is going to win this competition? Uh huh. Who do y'all think is going to win this competition? <laughs> so it would not be a good competition unless then Miss Susan gets a pie in the face on March 1st. I feel like I'm a little outnumbered. <laughs> so right, you got this. I, I can feel it. If the kids win the competition, who do you think gets a pie? Oh, I get a pie in the face. It's a good thing. I like pie. Because I have a feeling y'all are going to be really good at this competition. So when you bring your bags back any Sunday in February, any Wednesday in February, you're going to bring them right over here by this side of the stage. All the kids will have their bags right here. Where are they going to have them? Yeah. And all of the adults are going to put their bags on that side of the stage. Every Sunday in February, every Wednesday in February, you can bring this bag back. Or you can bring any kind of bag. It doesn't matter. Just fill it with non-perishable food items so it can go to Skyline Urban Ministries to help those in our community who are in need. So you think you guys can do that? I, I said you think you can do that? Yeah. That's what I thought. And we're going to all be working together to make sure that Susan gets a pie in the face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I hope you will think on that as I invite our ushers to come forward and we give back to God his tithes and our offerings. Oh, Larry's got an announcement. <laughs> he thinks we need to have a tie. I bet we can work really hard at that. You just want to eat some pie. That's what it is. <laughs> Thank you, friends. Give him a hand. Thanks for coming up to help me today. And I'll call our ushers forward.
with me and as a family of faith let us affirm our faith together we believe in the one God creator and sustainer of all things father of all nations the source of all goodness and beauty all truth and love we believe in Jesus Christ God manifest in the flesh our teacher example and redeemer the Savior of the world we believe in the Holy Spirit God present with us for guidance for comfort and for strength we believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule, both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God, as the divine will, realized in human society, and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Let's remain standing as we continue to worship.
Here at St. Andrews, we are a loving, caring, overcoming community of faith centered in a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're new to our church, we are so glad that you have joined us for worship today, and we have a special gift for you just outside these back doors at our welcome counter, and I hope you'll stop by there after the service to pick that up. If you're joining us online, we're so glad that you have joined us as well, and our online minister has been there to greet you. Her name is Blair Harrison. Hope you'll ask her any questions that you have about St. Andrews. Friends, we are glad to be here as a family of faith to offer our prayers before God. There's a list of names on the screen behind me of those in our family of faith who have asked us to be in prayer for them. If you want to pick up an updated list, you can do that before you leave today at the back of the worship center as well. We pray for those in our family who have cancer, who are battling that disease, and we walk alongside of them in prayer, and we continue to pray for their healing. We also pray for those who are homebound and cannot be on site with us every Sunday, but they're still very much a part of our family of faith. And we pray for our missionaries. It's really great that we get to be a part of what God is doing around the world in places that many of us will never see, will never visit. But we have a part and a hand in what is going on there and what God is doing. And then we also pray for our expectant moms who are getting ready to welcome new little ones into their family. And we welcome them into our family of faith. I also want, to know, want you to know that we do pray for our deployed. I got some great news about Jeffrey Johnson from his grandfather, Jerry, today, that Jeffrey will be coming home on Wednesday, and he will get to stay in the United States. So we're really thankful for that and continue to pray for his safe return. And then we wanted you to know as well that we had twins born in our family of faith. The Skidmores uh, welcomed Cora and Patrick this past week. So I hope if you know the Skidmores, you'll reach out to them and let them know that you continue to pray for them. I want to remind you that there are kneeling rails here at the front of the worship center should you desire to come and pray while I am praying. I, I promise I'll give you enough time to walk down and kneel and to stay there for a little while before you have to make your way back to your seat. Sometimes it is good for us to go before the Lord in prayer in a kneeling position to remember that he is sovereign, that he is the Lord of our lives, and that we surrender our lives to him. So if you don't kneel before him today, I hope you will take an opportunity this week to kneel before him in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks that you are in this place with us. It truly is not understandable why you would consider us worthy of your presence, and yet you do. So God, we give you thanks that you would come and be with us, that you would dwell within us, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to live in us. God, I pray if there are those here today who have not yet surrendered to you, that they would be so inspired to surrender their lives because it, it is not until we fully surrender to you that we can actually start living. I know there are some here today who feel as though their lives are not worth living. They wonder if it's really worth it to get out of bed tomorrow. They may feel as though the ground that they are standing upon is not firm enough to hold them, that it's too shaky, that it might crumble that they take the next step. So God, would you please remind them today that you are our firm foundation, that you are our solid rock, that your promise to us is that you will never leave. And when we commit to you, it opens doors of that firm foundation to us, that when we take the next step, we can be sure of our footing. God, would you please remind us today that not only are you the firm foundation that we walk upon, but you take every step with us, guiding us, teaching us, helping us to know what to do in each situation. That's, what it, that's the blessing we get when we surrender to you. Sometimes in surrender, we're so afraid that we will lose something. But the only thing that we lose is ourselves and we gain new life in you. I can't think of anything better. God, I pray that you would help us today as a church, as a family of faith, to walk forward into the future knowing that you will be our firm footing as we go forward. I pray that you would help us 
to bind together as a family and to trust in your goodness and your holiness and in your promise that not even the gates of hell will overcome the church. So God, I pray that you would help us to be the church that you've called us to be. For you have always been the center of this church. You have always been at the heart of everything that we have done, whether it has been to serve those in our community or to proclaim the word of your son, Jesus Christ, or to teach our children and youth in our church or to teach the children of the community. You've always been at the center, God, and I pray that you will continue to be at the center, that each one of us will place you at the center of our lives so that as we walk forward as a family of faith, we will walk into the future that you have for us, a future that is good and right and hope-filled. For God, we want to continue to do your work. We want to bring your kingdom here on earth, and we want your Holy Spirit to move within us like a mighty rushing wind. For I know that you're stirring You're stirring our hearts. You're stirring our spirits. You're doing a great and mighty thing. So God, we surrender ourselves to you and we ask that you would continue your work in us. That we would see your miracles and your signs and your wonders. The presence of your Holy Spirit here. So that when people look at this church, what they see is a testimony of who you are. God, that's what we claim today. That's what we hope for. We put our hope in you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we know that you will complete that which you have begun. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes that possible. It's in his name that we pray, just like he taught us, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would try to hide it, but it's pretty obviously I'm limping this morning. It's got nothing to do with my back. It's got to do with this past Thursday. I was walking through here, and the lights were off. And I always forget I have to walk close to the seats because I tripped over this step that is right here. My ankle went Rice Krispies, Snap, Crackle, and Pop. And um, I've been diagnosed with a terminal condition. GOS, getting old stinks. <laughs> it's a self diagnosis. <laughs> but uh, it, it's not related to my back. I've had a lot of questions, a lot of people concerned, and, and I surely appreciate that. I appreciate uh, the thoughts and the prayers. Uh, I will be having back surgery on February 18th. So if you wonder the day you really need to ramp up some prayer on my behalf, that is the. Uh, the day I'm scheduled to have that done, and I, and I am appreciative of all the concern people have expressed. But this is not about me. I just answer those questions so you don't have to ask them and you're not distracted. Uh, this is about God, so let's pray real quick. Holy God, we bless you today, and we certainly pray that you will give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, and that you would give us a mind that understands clearly what you're asking of us. And all things that happen today, oh God, draw us closer to yourself so that we might be more of a part of what you're doing. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So my buddy Kirk had bought a new boat. and He was so excited about his new boat. He uh, couldn't wait to get it out on the lake. He had a house down on Lake Texoma. And the plan was uh, he had to go get his old boat out of its slip in the marina. And that meant we would go down early. We would uh, get the trailer, take it down to the marina, pull his boat out so there would be space. And so we got down there, we loaded up the trailer, and one thing he already knew was he had to do a little repair work to his trailer. He did not have a winch that worked very well. And so he bought a new winch. We're going to go down there. We're going to put the winch on. It Take that last ride on the old boat before the maiden voyage on the new one. And when we got the trailer loaded up, he goes... 
I don't have the tools I need to take this off. Now suddenly he went into this countenance of contemplation of how am I going to solve this problem? Am I, going to, am I going to have to drive back home to get the tools? That was really not a good option. Uh, do I need to go in town and buy more tools? Do I need to see if somebody around here will lend me some tools? And you could tell he, he was really trying to solve this problem. And that's when I reached in the back seat and I grabbed my socket set and my toolbox and I said, I bet I got stuff in here that will take care of this. Suddenly the heavens opened and the angels began to sing an a cappella version of the Hallelujah Chorus because Kirk was so excited. He was even giddy. And he said, my good buddy D.A. is going to help me out of this mess. And so we got the winch changed out. So here's a question I want to ask. I, I suspect all of us have had an expectation of how we can fix something when we don't have the proper tools. I mean, the tools Kirk had to fix that winch would have been like cutting down an oak tree with a butter knife. You understand? It just it, it could be done. It's going to take a really long time. But how many of you have ever tried to do something when you didn't have the right tools? In fact, we're going to take a poll. Hands raised. If this has happened to you, I appreciate your confession already. Y'all don't even know what I'm getting ready to ask. <laughs> how many, and, and I think men primarily in this, because women are much smarter. <laughs> how many men have broken the tip off a pocket knife when you're trying to use it for a screwdriver? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got a witness in the congregation today. There we go. Or how many of you have been, maybe you've been serving some vegetables, and you get your spoon, and you dip up, you know, your green beans or whatever it is, and then you have to put the spoon against the side of the pot to drain it because you don't have a slotted spoon. I, uh, yeah, I, I was actually talking to uh, Steve, our, our lead guitar player, between services. I said, I'm just curious, have you ever had to find something to use for a guitar pick because you didn't have a guitar pick. And he said, oh, yeah. He goes, I used one of those plastic things off a bread wrapper once. <laughs> and I would never thought of that. I, I find that, that some credit cards, when you cut them up, work pretty good. Uh, or even folded cardboard can sometimes be good. Chad didn't tell me what he used, but he's like, oh, yeah, I've, I've done that too. Whenever we don't have the right tools, whenever we don't have the things that we need, it just really makes the experience frustrating. And this, this works in a spiritual way, too, for us in the church, because we can read the story about the children of Israel when they were slaves in Egypt, and Pharaoh told them, you've got to keep making the same amount of bricks, but we're not going to give you straw anymore. And they began to cry, and they began to whine. We, we, we've got to have that bonding agent. We've got to have that to strengthen the bricks. How can we do this? I mean, they understood what it was like to not have the right tools or the right material. How do we get the equipment we need? We looked last two weeks ago at the story of Moses when his father-in-law Jethro came up and said, um, you, you can't keep settling all these disputes yourself. You've got to have more help. Pick out some people to help you. But after he picked out those people, when we read it says, and so this is what Moses had to teach them about settling disputes. He had to equip them for that. You see, we, we understand that when it comes to doing the work of God, that we have all been identified as people that God is going to use to accomplish his work. I mean, if, if you don't have the right things, if you don't have the right material, say, to build a doghouse, you could actually build a doghouse out of all the cardboard from your Amazon Prime purchases. <laughs> it's not going to be a very good doghouse, but you, you could do it. And so God has identified all of us, all of us who are followers of Jesus, disciples, Christians, however it is you call yourself that, you're in the pool. You've been identified as someone God's going to use. But after we have been identified, then we have to recruit. And that's what we talked about last week was the recruitment process. And, and many of you completed the inventories that we had and came and laid them on our altar and said, hey, this is what I'm going to help with. We're still working through those. I told the secretary I'd like to have them by Friday. She came in Thursday and said, uh, if I'm going to have these done tomorrow, I've got to take them home. I said, no, you're not taking them home. Just, you know, finish when you, you can. And, it, and if you weren't here last week and you wonder what we're talking about, there's a recruit inventory back on the back table of places that you can get involved in ministry. See, when we've been identified and we've been recruited, we understand that to do the work of God, which is called ministry, that this begins to change our identity about how we think about ourselves. This is how we ought to think about ourselves. Would you recite this aloud with me? 
I am a minister called by God, gifted by the Holy Spirit, ordained through baptism. I am a minister, and I offer my gifts in service to Christ. So we're called, we're gifted, we're ordained, we offer ourselves, but what if we don't have the right tools? What if we don't have the right materials? There's actually a scripture that I have found helpful for several years about how we might think about this. It's a scripture in the letter of, to the Ephesians. So this is a short scripture. I'm going to invite you to read this out loud with me today. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. So God gifts people in the church who have the responsibility to equip people for doing God's work, to equip people for doing ministry. When we as a staff are trying to recruit people, we understand that sometimes people may say, well, I don't really know how to do that. And our response is, don't worry. We can teach you how to do that. In fact, there's a uh, really wonderful experience that, that happened that helps us to understand that if you don't think you have the skills, you can learn the skills that are necessary for the task. Some of y'all will remember the name. Some of y'all know the person uh, that was a director of student ministries when I came to St. Andrews. His name was Tony Moran. Tony had grown up here in the church. He had been an intern under a previous youth minister. And when that youth minister left, Tony took his spot while he was still a college student. And eventually, he uh, became our director of student ministries. He had just graduated from college right when I came here. And that fall, I went to our programming staff and I said, hey, um, you need to come up with an itemized budget for what you think you're going to need to do ministry next year. Go ahead and work on that. And then when you're done, I want to sit down and go over it with you. That way, when I'm in finance committee, I can help explain if there's anything they don't understand. And so Tony brought me in his list. Here's what I think needs to happen. And as I looked at it, it looked like everything on his list was a party. There's a Super Bowl party, there's an end-of-school party, there's a back-to-school party, there was a Christmas party. And I just looked at it and I said, Tony, it looks like everything on here is a party. I, I don't see anything about buying curriculum for Sunday school or for small groups. I don't see anything about a mission trip. I don't see anything about scholarships for people going to camp. I said, I, I don't think this is going to work. And, and he had this very contrite and humble look on his face, and he just said, I just turned in what we've always turned in. I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. Now, I'm sure that was hard for him to admit because here's a new pastor, and I'm the youth minister, and I'm telling you, I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. He probably felt like he was going to be condemned for that. But my response was, hey, that's not a problem. I can teach you how to do that. You can learn certain skills that are needed. And, and what happens in those of us who have experience, those of us who have those skills, need to help equip other people for the skills that are necessary to do the work that God has called us to do. It's always been God's design that shared leadership was a part of what happened. And that's why God gifts people to the church to teach them how to do things. But here's something else I, I think of when I think of that story, and that is the next generation of Christian leaders needs to be equipped to carry on God's work. If, if, if people with all the experience are always doing all the work, how do other people get the experience needed when God is calling them to step up and lead the church? I had a wonderful example of this that happened to few years ago. Uh, Y'all may know the people I'm about to talk to, but uh, I didn't ask them permission to use their names. It's not like when I talk about my family. Um, and, and so you, you may know who these people are, but about, I don't know, I think it was about five years ago, our church felt like we were stuck, and we went through the consulting process with the unstuck group to help us as a church. And in putting together a team, we had some people that, that started that and said, hey, we want to do this. 
And so they were a part of that. But then Unstuck said, here's what you need to do. You need to recruit some young adults, kind of some middle-aged adults, and some senior adults. Y'all don't take it personally that I looked at you when I said senior adults, okay? <laughs> and so that, that's what we did. Everybody had their perspective and their understanding of, of what would be a great way to do this in the church. And at the end of Unstuck, we had these action groups that would then follow up on the things that we felt like we needed to do. One of those action groups was called the facilities group. So we needed someone to help lead that that was familiar with facilities, who had uh, insight into what was going on, and, and we looked at someone, I will just refer to him as an elder statesman in our church. He's been here from day one, and, and he has been involved in building projects and capital campaigns and general administration. He just really knew what we needed to do, and so we asked him to lead that, and he agreed. On the other side, we had a young father. We're going to call him an up-and-comer. You know, a young father who had said, I really wondered how you could help in this church. I wanted to be more involved, and I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to ask. I was so glad y'all asked me to do this. Well, in their facilities group, what began to happen was uh, this, this young father, man, he had passion. He had drive. He had enthusiasm. He had energy. Hey, we need to do this, and we need to find out this. And this is when our elder statesman understood this guy's ready to go. This guy's ready to be turned loose. He wants to carry the ball. And so the elder statesman called us and said, I'm not going to lead this group anymore. I'm going to turn it over to this young guy. I'll still be there to help him if he needs help. I'll still be active in it. But I don't need to do this anymore. Somebody else can do this. What a beautiful picture of, of, of how it's supposed to work. People with experience, people with gifts, helping raise up the next generation of leaders. Now you may wonder, did we put the old guy out to pasture? <laughs> and the answer is no. <laughs> we still call him. We still rely on his wisdom and his experience to help us understand and get help for things because he knows how to do it and he's willing to equip other people to do it. Helpful thing. We have the gifts. We have the calling. We have the ordination, the set apartness. We offer ourselves. If we don't have the task, there are people God gives to help equip us for that task. But I would suggest to you that, that some of the skills perhaps that we think of are not the skills that really Paul is writing about. You see, Paul's been in prison for at least two years when he writes this letter to the Ephesians. And in those two years, he may have started to understand, I'm coming near the end of my life. I'm coming near the end of my ministry. I can't go out to all these places and travel the way I used to. But his arrest was kind of like a house arrest. People could still come to him. So he could train them and then deploy them. But I think the thing that the Apostle Paul was most concerned about was the transmission of the faith, the preaching of the good news, the sharing of the good news of the resurrection in Jesus and how God uses that to bring salvation to all people. So when we read this scripture, it seems that the primary work that's being lifted up is building up the church, building up the people, helping people to have a foundation of faith and then building upon that so people feel confident whenever they're sharing the good news that Jesus has risen from the dead, whenever they're sharing the good news that because of what Christ has done, we don't have to live in fear anymore because we love a gracious and merciful God. That's good news. And brothers and sisters, I can tell you, uh, it, it's, uh, it's interesting to me. This is not something y'all are interested in, but bear with me. It's short. We say creeds every Sunday, and yet the United Methodist Church is not considered to be a creedal church. I don't really understand that. I've grown up Methodist, and I've said creeds my whole life, but we're not really considered to be a creedal church. There are some churches that are considered creedal, and then there are other churches that never use creeds, and they seem to do fine. But here's why we do the creeds. Because they help us to know and understand what it is we believe. If we don't know and understand what we believe, and this again is what I believe God is trying to help us understand, if we don't know and understand what we believe, then we're going to be just going willy-nilly with whatever a popular teaching is. 
We'll, we'll just let the wind blow us around and we'll jump in whatever boat is sailing, even if that boat's got a leak. And so it is, we talk about the creeds because they help us to understand what we believe. That we believe in God, a Father, Creator of both heaven and earth. And we believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. Begotten, not made, begotten Son. And we would look at Jesus and we would say, His birth was miraculous, His ministry was fabulous, His death was scandalous, and His resurrection was glorious. Do I have a witness this morning? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. You see, we we use the creeds to help us know what we believe because the goal is not just to learn a skill that can be used to serve the church. The goal, as we read the scripture, is that we're going to have these things until we all, not some, until we all attain maturity of faith. That's a good word. You see, it's God's design that we equip people for doing God's work to proclaim that good news until all attain maturity of faith. This is what our discipleship pathway was about last year. Here are things that we can teach you. Here are things you can learn. Here are things that we can experience because we believe that through these experiences you will encounter the living God because we're all on this spiritual journey looking to become mature in our faith. So friends, this morning I want to ask you four questions. Four simple questions for your consideration. The first question is, what is God calling me to do? You're called by God. You admitted that a while ago. (laughs) What is God calling me to do? My buddy Kirk called me to go help him put a winch on his boat. But he did not stop to think, what equipment do we need? So if God's calling you to do something, what equipment do you need? Or are you content to try to make bricks without straw? Who is someone who can help equip me? I I understand in ministry, sometimes I'm asked to do things... And I really, you know, I'm like Tony was. I don't know how to do what you're asking me. So I call people. Hey, I need to do this. What can you tell me? What can you inform me? How can you help me do what God is calling me to do? And then lastly, is there someone I should equip for ministry? Because here's one of the realities as I understand it. As an older, more experienced person, I was able to help somebody that was younger and inexperienced. But I spend a lot of time with people that are younger and inexperienced. And I'm always learning a lot from them. Even as I try to equip them for basic skills, they equip me with this new stuff that I don't really understand. See, you can't sail on a new boat to get the old boat out of the water. You, you can't get that old boat out of the water unless you have the right equipment to change the winch on that boat trailer. But God somehow will provide all the materials all the resources, all the equipment, all the tools that we need. Sometimes we just have to look for them. And sometimes we have to ask for them. Would y'all pray with me? Most holy God, if you're calling us to do a work and we don't have the tools, And we don't have the right materials. We just ask, Lord God, that you would give us the things we need. We thank you for the gifts of people in the church who are able to help us know and understand how we can do things. But most of all, oh God, we pray that as your spirit is given to us and as your spirit dwells within us, that we would understand that that is where we get the power to share the good news of the resurrection. That is where we get the power to be witnesses to these things that we know and believe to be true about you. And in all these things, oh God, we want to be faithful so that you will be glorified. And so we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, as you're able, would you stand as we sing? This song can become our prayer today as we continue to ask God to equip us 
even when we feel as though we're not qualified, God works within us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Let's sing. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes and see that you're shaping my life. All I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you that God's spirit is strong in you. Have a great week.